Hey, listeners, before we jump into today's episode, I want to invite you to join me, IRL, at VultureFest on November 12th and 13th in Los Angeles at the Hollywood Roosevelt. I'll be there in the flesh. Come hang with me. I'm going to do a special live episode of Into It with the one, the only, the icon and legend herself, Miss Cheryl Lee Ralph. Yes, Cheryl Lee Ralph of Abbott Elementary fame and also everything else. It's going to be so fun. Come hang with me and the rest of Vulture. You can grab your tickets now at VultureFestival.com. If you use promo code Sanders, S-A-N-D-E-R-S, you can get 15% off your ticket price. That's because I love you. Sanders, S-A-N-D-E-R-S. Come hang with me and the Cheryl Lee Ralph and a whole bunch of other cool people. I cannot wait for this. I hope to see you there. Hey, I'm Sam Sanders. You are listening to Intuit from Vulture. This week on the show, we are discussing what might have been quite possibly the strangest TV show of the last several years, FX's Atlanta. I'm interviewing one of the big writers of that show, Stephen Glover, brother of Donald Glover. But first, before that, a game. We're going to play Into It, Not Into It. This week, we have a very special guest, famous in the world of Podcastlandia. You hear her <laughs> here, there, and everywhere. Daisy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Sam. I'm really excited to be here. It's great to have you. You know, I mean, I I got a lot of friends that work in podcasting. You have like yeah. 77 different jobs in podcasting. You make <laughs> podcasts, you talk on podcasts, you're guests on podcasts. What's your exact title, titles, plural? Oh my God, right? Good point. Good question. I'm currently at Slate, where I am the senior supervising producer. Uh, and I that means that I oversee a bunch of our culture shows. Yeah. Well, I will say, with your culture experience, you're probably going to be the most qualified guest ever to play Ooh. the game with us this week. This game is called Into It, Not Into It. The game is simple. I share a few stories from the week. You tell me if you're into these stories or not into these stories and why. And yes. at the end, I'll tell you if your opinions are good. Ooh, love it. Let's do it. All right, here we go. Daisy, question. Yes. Okay. Are you into or not into The White Lotus season two? Oh, okay. I was wondering if this would come up. Um, <laughs> I, hoping or wondering? Both. I was both hoping and wondering. Um, I, I, Quite honestly, I wish I could say more about the season, but I'm kind of purposefully waiting to binge it all at once. I really did enjoy the first season, but that's also how I watched it because it doesn't have like a, a hugely compelling specific plot and it's more kind of like sit in this weirdness for a while. That's the kind mm -hmm, of show I want to mm -hmm. binge. Um, but I do love Jennifer Coolidge and Aubrey Plaza. So I'm looking forward to it, but I haven't watched it yet. Okay, I'm so into you're into it. it. You're into the idea yes. of it, even if you haven't yes. watched it yet. All right. I will say I've been watching. I've watched both uh, episodes that are out right now. Okay. I'm okay. not that into it. Yeah. And I hate to admit it because I love Mike White and I loved season one, but it's just really hard to create that kind of moment. I think what the first White Lotus season had going for it was that it came in this moment of like a lockdown because there was a new variant. Yes. So all of a sudden we were back home with nothing to do. So we all watched it together. I yes. don't feel that communal aspect with viewing it this time because we're No, back that's outside. already gone. I can tell. Yeah. Right? I can already like tell this, that that like, part's gone. And then besides that, they're trying to, like, recreate season one plot-wise without doing season one. So, like, they're at a luxury resort again, but it's in Italy, not Hawaii. Jennifer Coolidge is still in the cast, but everyone else is new. There are two outspoken, pretty young women on the show. Only this time, they aren't American teenagers. They're Italian prostitutes. Okay. And it's just, like, the plug-and-play yeah. of it all. The plug-and-play of it all, it's like... That's a recipe for not living up to expectation, exactly. in my Plug opinion. Plug and play works for comfort food, but not for when you actually want something to live up to high expectations. Yeah. Even the theme song, Daisy. We were just talking so about So they've this moved too. from yeah. Hawaii to Italy, <laughs> but they kept the same, same theme song, but just added like a little EDM beat yeah. behind it. I want to let you hear it. You got to hear it. Wait for it. My eyes are getting really Wait wide. for it. It's going to go full EDM. Here's the drop. 
This does feel like I'm being tortured at a spa. Yeah, this is, um, wow. <laughs> but I mean, I do hope that we get some kind of, um, I would say let's get some wonderful equivalent to the salad tossing scene. Like that's what I really want to make sure that we don't forget. <laughs> I felt like that was the most podcast friendly way to say that, but. <laughs> yes. And apparently there was a prosthetic salad. For yes. That. Remember that discourse? Bless. Like, was it a real exactly. salad or not? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Second question. Daisy, are you into or not into Elon Musk banning Twitter accounts that impersonate him? Oh, my God. I mean, I am not into that. And I feel like you have got to be <laughs> such a hypocrite who doesn't want to admit that they are a hypocrite to be into it. It's wild. I mean, it really just shows it's wild. how sensitive he is um even as he mm -hmm. tries to mock others for such things i mean it's so we are now in what week two or three of elon yeah. musk owning twitter and the dumpster fire just keeps getting bigger it's felt chaotic already he's been tweeting all kinds of things that are contradictions of his previous tweets. He's laid off half the staff and asked some of them to come back. He's also been issuing edict via tweet, many of which can't be enforced. Like he promised this new verification system. It's not ready yet. And now he says he's going to ban all Twitter accounts that impersonate people or, or do parody without saying they're parody. But he's not applying that policy across the board, it seems as if, at least to start, he was only banning parody accounts that were mocking him and impersonating him. And the biggest block was Kathy Griffin. He took Kathy Griffin off of Twitter for claiming to be Elon Musk in parody and jest, we know. But since she was kicked off, did you hear this part? She snuck back onto Twitter using her dead mother's Twitter account. Oh my gosh! No, I had not. Now I need to go find this. You gotta. I, I will tell you the name of the account, and I'll read some of the tweets from the account. But please, I'll tell you what. I'm into that. Yes, I'm so into that. Oh, that I am into. <laughs> People finding a way to get on to make fun of Elon. Absolutely, that yeah. I'm into. I have found one of Kathy Griffin's tweets from her oh dead gosh, mother's yes. account to get back Love at it. Elon after he banned her original account for impersonating Elon Musk. <laughs> Kathy, through her dead mother's Twitter account, wrote to Elon, quote, Elon, this is Maggie contacting you from the spirit world to tell you <laughs> you're a douchebag. This is not parody. This is the actual ghost of Kathy Griffin's boxed wine loving mother saying, I'm going to get tipsy and throw my bingo cards at you. All caps, not a parody. To the moon, a hole. Hashtag free Kathy. <laughs> More power to Kathy. More power to the ghost of Kathy's mom. Ugh, fight the good true. fight. <laughs> fight the good I fight. I want to meet more mom ghosts. <laughs> I would be down. Last question for you, Daisy. Are you into or not into? Dolly Parton finally getting inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and at the induction ceremony performing a new song that she wrote Aww. called Rockin'. Oh my God. Completely into it. Can we hit Rockin'? It's a treat. Dolly is a treat. I don't know that I'm going to end up yeah. listening to that a lot, but it's a treat and I'm going to end up showing <laughs> it to at least like four more people myself. Yeah. This is the thing. I don't love that song. It's a song, but I yeah. love Dolly. I and love everything Dolly. I find out about this story, it just makes me love her even more. So when yes. they first wanted to get her in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, she said, no, I don't deserve it. I haven't earned it yet. And then after she won, instead of just winning and taking the award, she changed clothes and then came on stage in a rock and roll leather outfit and chains and said, basically, if I'm in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I better rock. Here's an electric guitar. Let's get rocky. And she did it. Just class act. I love that so much. I love that so much. And it's also like very like 80s, 90s in its way too of like, I'm going to go play in this other genre of music because they are all really yeah. separate in a way that they were then. And you would be like, you know, it's like when Janet Jackson did Black Cat. And it was like, oh, yeah. Everyone's we're like, not Whoa. just going to do it. We're going to like present it like a rock song. Like that's how this feels. Mm -hmm. uh, I yeah. mean, Dolly is, 
I don't trust people that don't respect Dolly, at least, you know? There like, you go. There you go. She's just, yes. I'm so glad that we are consistently trying to give her her flowers while she is here. Like, she is just one of the best among us. She's a real yeah. one. She's amazing. She's a real one. Yeah. Uh, all right, we've reached the end of the game. We have both agreed that we're into Dolly, not so much into Elon. And both of us want to be into the idea of the White Lotus season two. Yes. But stay tuned. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Daisy. Yeah. What a pleasure. You win. You're a winner. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, listeners, you can find Daisy Rosario every now and then on Pop Culture Happy Hour. And she runs a bunch of podcasts for Slate. And you'll hear her sometimes on the Slate podcast. In case you missed it, I C Y M I. There's this episode in season four of Atlanta that is truly weird. Donald Glover's character, an industry agent, he goes on this quest in the episode to sign D'Angelo. He ends up entering a D'Angelo waiting room through a fast food chain restroom door marked D'Angelo. Hey, um, I'm here to see D'Angelo. Only to have it revealed to him after days of waiting. Where's D'Angelo? In what's kind of a jail cell. Can I please see D'Angelo? That D'Angelo is actually a, quote, complex network of men, women, and D'Angelo's spread across countries. You asked to experience D'Angelo. In this moment for you, we are D'Angelo. And then Donald Glover's character just leaves. And he never actually finds D'Angelo. And that's it. It is a very strange episode of a very strange show. But Atlanta isn't just very strange. It is often kind of brilliant. What began as a small story about a rapper named Paperboy trying to make it with help from his manager slash cousin and his stoner friend, it has turned into something that really can't be categorized. I sat down recently with Atlanta's executive producer, Stephen Glover. He is the brother of Donald Glover. And Stephen left college, where he was studying chemical engineering, to help write and create what would become FX's Atlanta. In our chat, Glover talked at length about why Atlanta has remained so strange. It's because it was supposed to provoke you. That was the point of the whole show. Atlanta ends its fourth and final season this week, so there's no better time to share my chat with Stephen. We go deep on Atlanta, what it says about race, and the challenges of making weird and unexpected art. I love this chat. I hope you do as well. All right, enjoy. My, I guess, biggest question to start discussing the show is like, how would you classify it? Is Atlanta a comedy? Is it a drama? Is it horror? Is it satire? I can't (laughs) decide on one word. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a mix of things, but I would say... First and foremost, it's a comedy. I think, you know, the thing I've realized from doing four seasons of Atlanta is, like, stuff I think is funny, some people might be like, that's terrifying. Or that's... Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> or they might be like, that's, like, very sad. Well, that I think that's, like, one of the questions I have when I watch the show. There are some moments where I'm like, oh, this is really, 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 really smart. But I cannot tell if they want me to leave this episode doubled over in laughter or in (laughs) tears or in tears. But like, there's some stuff that is just like, it speaks to the sad reality of racism here in America. And you're like, this is worth crying over, but also damn, that was a punchline. Well, I mean, like even early on, like Donald, I remember was like, you know, this is like the black perspective. This is what it feels like to be black. That's what the show kind of is as like surreal so and weird and at the same time yeah so it's like <laughs> if you're black you very like it, all you have to do is like look at twitter whenever something <laughs> bad happens literally a nuclear bomb could go off tomorrow and people would be making jokes why you was know? that bomb late black as fuck <laughs> exactly like oh this bomb black <laughs> 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 this is i mean that's like i feel like being black especially in the south a lot of stuff, you know, you kind of, even though it's like bad, you kind of laugh at it. You have to laugh at it a little bit. 
you know, I get why people would be like, this is heartbreaking. And I'm like, some of it is, you know, heartbreaking and sad. But, you know, the show is always based in, like, humor, I, I think. Yeah. Do you think about where viewers land by the end of an episode? Because sometimes I feel like what y'all are saying with this episode is like, fuck a viewer. We want to piss you <laughs> off. We want to piss you off. Deal. Well, I think people get pissed off so easily now. And it's like, Everybody feels like they're supposed to be pissed off about stuff. There's people who literally watch stuff to be pissed off, like finding things <laughs> to get mad about, which is like stupid and like makes TV very unenjoyable, makes all art very unenjoyable. So it's like we never want to like piss people off. We're not like being provocative in a way of just like, yeah, let's get a reaction out of people. I think a lot of the time we just try and go into like nuance you know we try and get into the gray areas of things and if, you know you can't really do that today a lot of the times being in the gray area is the same as being an enemy you know there is no gray area on mm -hmm. donald trump you can't mm -hmm. be like well sometimes he was funny like, <laughs> you can't say that you, know, you, you can't, really you can't, can't say, say that. that you have to be like he's the worst person ever or you have to be like he's the greatest person ever but so, sometimes his comedic timing was pretty brilliant he, I know you can't say that. He is but definitely like, the funniest president we've ever had. I used to had. be at some of his rallies before he won. <laughs> and, like, he knew how to hit a punchline in a room. It, I hate even <laughs> even saying that. I'm like, no. There's a there's a clip where uh, he's, like, on the White House lawn, and somebody asks him a question. And he's like, that's a dumb question, but you're dumb. So I... <laughs> So you ask a lot of dumb questions. And then he, like, walks away, and he shakes his head, like... <laughs> What a dummy. Like, it's so good. <laughs> I literally watch that clip sometimes just to laugh. You just go back and yeah. laugh. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> he did have great comedic timing. What is... Does ever, does FX ever come to y'all and say, actually, no. <laughs> actually, you cannot make the death of a fake Tupac funny. Actually, no, you cannot make foster parents killing their foster kids funny. Actually, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think, no, that, that's what's great about FX. And early on, we were making this show, you know, we were like, where do we want to take this? And, were, you know, or where would this show be? And I remember I was like, yeah, it should be on TV so that it can be week to week. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, it's got to be somewhere that'll let us like obviously do out there stuff. And FX is always been very open to stuff. I mean, of course, they'll they'll be like, you know, what if, you know, are you sure you want to do this? Like, sometimes... Give me an example of one of those. <laughs> well, starting season three with an episode that did not have Darius, Earn, Paperboy, or Van in it. You know, they're like, are you sure you want to do this? And we're like, yeah, we want to do this. But I mean, season three was very polarizing because of episodes that didn't have the main cast in A it. Lot so, yeah, yeah, you know, but, you know, that's what we wanted to do. That's, like, what we wanted to do artistically. So it's, like, I think they were kind of, like, yeah, are you sure about that? And I'm, like, for good reason, because they're trying to make <laughs> palatable, you know, network TV that can reach a mass audience. And, you know, we're trying to do something different. What maybe. is that something different, if you had to put it in a nutshell? We're trying to make interesting TV. I They're think two that, different things for you. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's like the thing where they say like people enjoy stories they already know the ending to. Yeah. More than stories they don't know the ending to. I keep talking. I haven't seen Top Gun yet. You know the ending. <laughs> well, yeah, it was funny. I haven't seen Top Gun yet, but I want to see it. And I was, I, I was talking to one of the Atlanta writers, my friend Swank, yesterday about it. And I'm like, why is this like, you know, because I have my own theories about why I think this movie is like doing so well and what's good about it. But he was, but he, one thing he did say to me, he was like, I mean, you know, everything that's going to happen in this movie, you know, all the beats, but it's still enjoyable. When I was younger, I always used to hate stuff where it's like, oh no, like Superman's about to die. And you're like, no, he's not. He's Obviously, not. It, we never, I never felt like he was even yeah. close to dying. Yeah. You know, like, like that, that always used to like irk me a little bit. But a lot of people, you know, they just want the feeling Superman. Not just a lot of people, like most people yeah. are into this archetypal hero's journey. Nobody's watching Avengers to really see wanting die. to see Thanos win, you know? <laughs> so then it seems as if the entire premise of Atlanta is rejecting that. Yeah. 
I like the Law and Order episodes where the bad guy wins sometimes. Wow. Those are the better Law and Order okay. episodes where the guy <laughs> gets off the hook yeah. at the end. Because then you're like, oh, wow. They didn't have to do that. I've seen a hundred episodes in the hundred first one. The bad guy be the case, yeah. you know. Who of all the characters in Atlanta would you be most satisfied with if they had a Top Gun journey? And just one. <laughs> Paperboy. You know, because Paperboy, I feel very close to him because I feel like... I want to protect him the most of all the characters in the well, show. Well, he's definitely... Which is crazy because he needs no protection. <laughs> I mean, he does, though. He definitely is my favorite character is because he is complicated. And I think everybody either feels like Paperboy or knows somebody like that. You know, a guy who... <laughs> Who you kind of wanted to see win, who maybe you did like you didn't mm-hmm. think it was possible, and like, mm-hmm. but he's like a real guy, a, you know, a guy that you like would love to hang out with or, or be around a good friend, and you're <laughs> kind of worried for what's going to happen to him, but you want to see him pull through. And I think when we think about like rappers, and we're like, what's the end game? What's like a successful rapper's journey? I guess most people would think Jay-Z. When you think about that, though, it's like 1%, less than that, of all rappers end up with a trajectory like that. Yeah. So, you know, asking the question of where could Paperboy's journey end, you have to think about, like, where would you want, like, a real rapper's journey to end? And when you think about rap, then you start to think about where would you want the culture's journey to end or, like, a black person's journey to end. Somebody, you know, because I think Paperboy's struggle is very synonymous with a lot of Black people's experience. Even though we're not rappers, <laughs> we're not all rappers, we're not all from the hood. I think everybody obviously well, understands that story. It's very clear. Well, and, and, and like the story is, Black culture is an asset for Black people for a certain amount of time. And then after some amount of time, it's less attractive to the outside world. And what do you do next? Or at least like the pieces of culture that you're bringing. It's like, do you almost feel the same about yourself? You're making this show that feels young and black and fresh, but you know at some point the thing you're doing is just less cool. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, that's definitely like a theme in this season. You know, there's youth culture in a lot of things. You could be like, it's fashion, it's blah, blah, blah. But when you sit back and really, like, think about it, like, it affects Black people the most, almost, you know? Like, DMX is an incredible rapper, you know? (laughs) Put out two albums in the same year that were, like, super influential, just good, you know, Mm -hmm. great works. And then it's like, you know, he ends up, like, dying, like... Way too young. Way too young, kind of, not destitute, but, like... You know, and it's easy for people to be like, oh, man, you know, DMX was great. Give him his flowers online and then, like, move on kind of. But I'm like, the day the the lead singer of The Who dies or something, like, <laughs> there's, like, a lose much bigger... Well, there's also an infrastructure. Yeah. You know, like, there's also an infrastructure built up to let white creatives continue to sustain themselves even after they age out. You become a professor and then you teach and then you become a creative director for some tech company. And like there's this path that it Mm -hmm. feels like the culture lays out for white creativity to sustain itself until death. (laughs) That that industry doesn't do the same, I think, for black people. And I feel that question being asked now with Paperboy in the show. Yeah. He can't age out. He has to literally insert himself into a young white person to continue to make it. (laughs) Well, that's the way that you're kind of taught to survive. Like, that's the only way that seems viable, you know? And I think the guy, the character Bunk that he's talking to says something. So, Paperboy is performing a bar mitzvah. Mm -hmm. And the father of the kid is like, I want you to teach my kid how to do what you do. I'll pay you a million dollars to, like, shadow him and train him. He then goes to meet the young white kid who already thinks he's a cool rapper in his own right. Who kind of doesn't care about doesn't Paperboy, care. you know. Yeah. And then this other older black rapper in the studio as well says, hold on, hold on, hold on. I know the secret. Come to this meeting with me and my other aging black male rapper friends. <laughs> and at that meeting, the character Bunk tells him about this idea of the young white avatar. Yeah. Which is basically that, like, if you're an aging black rapper, 
to stay in the industry and sustain yourself, you're going to have to just basically find a young white rapper that you manage and control and mentor. <laughs> I, mean, I can make an album better than them kids, win a Grammy, and then use the clock to go on tour again. Mm. And your album would be better. But nobody wants to hear you. Because you're old. The character Bunk, he says something to Alfred where he's like, yeah, you know, like, investing stocks, all that stuff, saving money is, like, fine if you want to, like, live a mediocre, like, nice but not extravagant life. But if you want to live this life you're accustomed to, like, it costs money, you know? And it's like, I think about this all the time. I literally said this yesterday. Uh -huh. I think when you're Black, you're like, you know, there's no going back. What do you mean? <laughs> like, if you get some money, there's no going back. You can't, be, like... You can't me, be broke again. Yeah, you know, it's funny. <laughs> These Gucci slides stay up. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. Me, like, I've always felt like I don't need a lot to, like, make myself happy. Like, I would... I don't, and yet you're in Gucci pants. Exactly. I, <laughs> I got to waste this money somehow. But, <laughs> but, you know, I think there's this idea of, like, you can't go back which is also terrifying to, like, Black people always, which forces them to do stuff like that, you know? Do you think I, it's more terrifying to Black people than just people and white people and all people? <laughs> well, I'll give you an example. There's a there's a song called splack a -Velli. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if your viewers would know this. There's an old song called splack a -Velli. Who does that? The song? I can't remember what the, guy, what the dude's name is. I want to say splack a <laughs> 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 I remember a friend of mine, he works at like a gas company in like Atlanta. He's like, man, Splacavelli is like one of my, uh, <laughs> you know, regional managers or something <laughs> like that. Like, dude, like Splacavelli is, and we're like, wow, that's like hilarious and like crazy. He's like, yeah, you know, so everybody in the, uh, in the, Building just calls him Splackavelli. <laughs> Only the black people know he's Splackavelli. <laughs> <laughs> the, the white higher ups have no idea what this means or who he is. And I'm like, I always think about the idea of a rapper who has a hot song and then trying to get a regular job afterwards. You, you think know? that tension is worse and harder for black creatives than white creatives? Yeah, because it's like you're seen as a screw up. It's like you had a golden ticket and you blew it. And like, if I was you, I would have like turned into Jay-Z and like going in the opposite direction is not an option. Yeah. You know, so it makes you do all sorts of things. It makes you get a YWA. It makes you... <laughs> Start doing things that are against your integrity or whatever. Have you, you done know? anything like that? <laughs> no, not yet. I always, <laughs> <laughs> I always, I mean, that's what I try. That's what I strive for. I realize, like, I have to remind myself sometimes. I'm like, man, I'm not a writer. Like, I'm not like a uh, Hollywood screenwriter. You are writing scripts in an Emmy winning show. I definitely am doing that. Okay. But I'm like, as far as like my actual like. Not even like persona, but like what encompasses who I fully am. You know, because I remember Donald said something to me. You're not like a Hollywood writer. They'll try and fit you into this box of uh, being a Hollywood writer so that they can devalue you sometimes. Mm, you know, yeah. do it. Our, and then you realize you're just like, you're literally just a tool being used to write things for other people. You know, yeah. so I'm like, I definitely don't want to be that. And I'm always like, my goal isn't to make the most money. It's just to make enough money that I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. <laughs> wow. Yeah. The writer's room is all black? Yes. Has it been that the whole time? It has. Actually, so the so the last season, Francesca is Hispanic. She's the only non-black writer we've had, actually. So the first two seasons, all black and we had one Hispanic person come on in the third and fourth okay. season. What was the, like, moment in that all-Black writer's room where you were most like, this could only have happened because the writer's room was all-Black? <laughs> I want a specific instance. Oh, man. I mean, you know, it's funny. People people really like the barbershop episode. Okay. I mean, there's a, there's a barber... <laughs> that I have in Atlanta. Shout mm -hmm. out to Mr. His name is literally Mr. That's his Mister. name. 
if that ain't the blackest thing. I know, Mister. <laughs> Mister. <laughs> That's such a black name it really to be is. like, just name your son Mister. That way he'll get respect. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like jumping, like going around racism. Like, <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. He's when like, you yes, come into sir. the bank, they'll have to call you Mister. It came from this idea of like, I, you know, it's like all barbers have like seventeen jobs. They have like <laughs> like 17 things going on. They have like they live such chaotic lives and you want to get a haircut and you're willing to put up with a certain amount of like shenanigans just because you're like it's worth it, you know. Yeah. And I, and I think that's like a, a very black idea. Oh boy. What what are you doing? Leaving. Leave Man, baby, you can't leave me here with half a haircut, man. Look at this shit, man. Come on now. It's cool cuz you come with me. Like, some of the feelings we have in that episode could only come from Black people being in those, like, yeah. spaces and, and feeling that way, yeah. you know? Yeah. You know, we're talking now about some of the creative license that being in an all-Black writer's room or an all-Black plus one writer's room gives you. But have there been moments when y'all have censored each other in a way that surprised you? It's funny. As we got towards, like, season four, this is when the room became the biggest— you know, we had the most people in it. I remember there was a conversation. We did an, an episode about therapy. Er, we see Earn in therapy, you know, going to therapy sessions. With an incredibly attractive therapist in an incredibly <laughs> oversized office. No therapist office is that big. <laughs> well, here's part of the reason, you know. <laughs> Tell me, please. <laughs> part of the re- I remember there was a conversation of like, we don't want to discourage black people from going to therapy. I remember oh, that gosh. was like a thing that came up where I was like, kind of like, no, oh, like I don't care about that. But at the same time, I, uh, I like, I, I get the sentiment, you know, when you're a black show, there's always like this responsibility that I think a lot of well, white shows don't there's have. There's a like pressure to be, to perform after school special. Exactly. So what you're saying to all the Black viewers watching Atlanta who saw that episode, that when you sign up for therapy as a Black person, you get a hot, light-skinned, tall therapist with a big office and great natural life. We're at least saying it's possible. (laughs) Like, friends, you see their apartment, and it's like, obviously, (laughs) nobody's apartment in New York looks like that, but it's aspirational. It's like, you could live like that. (laughs) You could have a hot therapist who has a giant office with a lot of books. And gives you a floor pillow. If you got enough money. <laughs> yeah. But this is what I... So, speaking of that episode, so we see your brother's character in therapy talking about just kind of some racial anger he has about the way some white folks have been treating him. So much of the show feels like it's thinking very critically about race and not asking viewers to come to too many conclusions about it, but asking them to think about it. I'm wondering, over the course of making this show for four seasons over several years has the way you think about race as you changed by making this show for me personally i'm like racism i don't expect it to end you you just have to like get over it in a <laughs> in a way which i don't want it to you know like i said like i'm already probably going to be canceled just for saying that like get over it guys <laughs> like I mean, that's that's not what i mean i was watching this uh Document. I watch a lot of documentaries, but there was some documentary about like some rowing competition, like the America's Cup or something that takes place like mm-hmm. in America, like a rowing competition. Mm-hmm. It's all mm-hmm. like the richest like oh, yeah. boat clubs, yacht clubs and stuff. <laughs> and like America won something crazy like 120 times in a row yeah. or something like that. They won like yeah. a crazy number of times, like since like the 1800s. Yeah. And it was like, well, who Australia had been trying to be all these countries are trying to beat them but you realize America had such a head start they were spending money on like scientists to figure out like oh, wow. the right velocities and how to like cut the boat to be like th- all these different things you know also being able to spy on the competition having enough money to send spies there's this huge mm-hmm. advantage that they had mm-hmm. and if you were thinking that like the Australia can't just be like one day like America's going to give up their advantage and like no. we're they're going to play us fair and square. It's like <laughs> yeah. no, you're going to have to figure out how to compete. I feel like for me it's like when I think of the show and how it's maybe affected the way that I think about race and the way I think about 
social change. It's like so much of Atlanta as a show is just saying there is no moral arc. There is no hero's journey. Life is much more complicated and is not linear at all. We're often just existing. There might not be a winner <laughs> or a loser. Vibe with it. No, definitely. I think for for Black people, you know, we just talked uh, about this too, where it's like Black people, their stories are always tied in, like you said, this after school special yeah. sort of like if thing. If you do it right, you win. Yeah, but I'm like, Wolf of Wall Street, they do everything <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Yeah, in that movie. They literally break laws. Uh-huh. They're doing cocaine and quaaludes, all this stuff. And then at the end, it's like, do they get their come up? It's like, no, not really. <laughs> like, it's fine. Yeah. You, you know, and I think there's this idea of like black morality that mm. I think, like, that's interesting to me. I'm actually like writing a movie that like deals with it. And there's just a bunch of ideas that I've had about it. And some of them manifest themselves in like season four. But I think there's like this idea of moral- black morality that I think is kind of a crutch to black people. And it's not just a crutch. It, it's a sacred crutch. <laughs> We're almost taught to look up to it and hold it and, and, and just revere it. So, and I feel like what Atlanta is saying is like, eh. Well, it's <laughs> like people will use that as a, as a way you. to pray against you. Like yeah. I said, like, America in this America's Cup. They'll yeah. be like, yeah, you know, do you hear the rules? Uh-huh. And at the same time, they'll been, break the rules, exactly. you know, like yeah. to help themselves and yeah. not feel bad about it. It's yeah. not like they're going to go back and be like, oh, we didn't, we need to vacate some of these trophies that yeah. we won. Like, No, they're not giving it back. <laughs> All right, last question for you because I know we've gone way over time, but this has felt like five minutes. It's been so fun. What is the biggest question you hope viewers keep asking themselves as Atlanta comes to a close that the show provoked? I think uh, the question I want people (laughs) to ask is like, what is interesting TV or interesting film? What encompasses that? You know, I think we're living in a time where there's so much content you know, even the word content has a negative connotation yeah. now because it just kind of sounds it's like... It's debasing. Yeah, it's like just bullshit you yeah. put out there for idiots to look at. You yeah. know, like it already has a bad connotation. So it's like with all of this stuff, it's like how do we decide what's good and what's interesting and what we want out of the art and the and the ideas we're getting? Do we want the same old thing Do we want to be comfortable and be in our comfort zone or do we want to try new things? And I think, yeah, you know, we've gotten criticism for stuff. We've done stuff that people don't like, but we took those chances and you end up getting the same stuff. I would hate for the next generation or the next great filmmaker to make boring shit just because he's scared that he might get canceled. You know, that would be what I would hate. So I'm like, yeah, that's the legacy is hopefully people want to try new things and be weird keep it weird keep it weird the like Atlanta austin story. or portland neither of which are anymore <laughs> but yes i think we're there man yeah i appreciate this thank you this was delightful it was great i had a good time thanks again to Stephen glover executive producer and writer on atlanta that show's fourth and final season ends this week on fx Culture Geist. Culture Geist. You're listening to Culture Geist. Culture Geist. I don't know, y'all. And now for a segment we're calling Culture Geist. About all the things we can't stop thinking about. The culture that's haunting you, haunting me, haunting all of us, for better or worse. My name is Zoe Guy. I'm a news writer at Vulture. And my culture, guys, this week is how fucking good the K-pop rookie girl groups have been this year. When I tell you that the music is musicking in a way that nothing else is musicking right now, New Jeans, Hype Boy, ooh, it's a hit. It has like early 2000s classic girl group flair. And the one that's not the single, but the B-side hype boy, it's like, 
Cause I know what you like, boy. And you can just bump it anywhere. Ive is another one to look out for. Their new song, After Like, has a little disco sample. And it's like, but after like. And it's like, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Usually in the fall, I'm like not checking for pop music. I need Sad Girl Mitski or like Faye Webster or Leve or something like that. But maybe it's the unseasonably warm weather. I don't know. Climate change. I'd rather just listen to the, these K-pop girls. So yeah, get into it. Hello, my name is Herschel Pandya and I cover comedy at Vulture. Ever since Netflix's new sitcom Blockbuster was greenlit, people online have been repeating the same take about how this show is Netflix's way of flexing gratuitously on the corpse of Blockbuster. Look, there's no easy way to say this. Seven more Blockbusters just closed. You're officially the last... And how this demonstrates I, uh, the toxic ruthlessness of capitalism. Hello. And it 1,000% is that. Come on. I'm the last man standing. How am I supposed to be the next turn? But also, we live in a culture where sometimes people hunt defenseless deer and then mount their heads on their walls like trophies. And I'm sure Spotify has a podcast or two about the decline of the record store. And the way we measure pickup in cars is literally called horsepower. So flexing on things we've made obsolete is just sort of a way of life for us. And for that reason, I say let Netflix step over the husk of Blockbuster like it's Alan Iverson over Toronto. Capitalism sucks anyway. Yeah, what's it like living such a dream? Well, you know, it has its ups and downs. At least this time we got a middling sitcom out of it. Sean Ramos from One Half of the Hosting Regime at Today explained, This week, every week of my life, really, I am haunted by all the television I've missed and the impossibility that I'll ever catch up. I wish it was freeing to know I'm never going to get that 30 Rock reference or that joke from The Office, but instead, it's eternally frustrating. When my friends talk about that Showtime season of Twin Peaks, I say I really do plan on getting to that one day. When I see another great interview with Damon Lindelof or Cord Jefferson, I'm reminded that just because I'm tired of comic book movies doesn't mean I'm not going to love The Watchmen. Every time I say Fleabag was amazing, I met with, yeah, but have you seen Killing Eve? No! I haven't yet. And while I'm at it, I love Will Forte, but I haven't gotten to Last Man on Earth, but that haircut is hilarious. Maybe I dodged a bullet with Ted Lasso. I'll probably never know. I'm not going to give Apple any more money. Sorry, Severance. Ditto for Disney. And the prequels, Dragon prequels, Breaking Bad prequels, Star Wars Rogue One prequels. But they got Tony Gilroy. Oh, they got Tony Gilroy? Maybe I'll just go watch Michael Clayton again. I'm never going to get to all this TV. Thanks again to Sean, Herschel, and Zoe. My Culture Guys this week is all the poop and vomit in Triangle of Sadness. It's kind of a satire of the rich, and it takes place on a fancy yacht cruise gone wrong. This movie has more pooping and more vomiting than I have seen in any movie ever in my life. So what do you do? I sell shit. Like projectile for minutes. There's one scene where there's one person who has it come out of both ends and you see it all. And here's the thing. It shouldn't work. You should hate it. You should walk out of the theater when you see all that stuff. But it works. Listeners, do you have a culture, guys? A thing in the culture that's been haunting you for days or weeks or even years? Share it with us. The more specific you are, the better. Just send us a short voice memo at intuit at vulture.com. Intuit at vulture.com. All right. If you like this show and want to support it, we could use your help. Subscribe to Intuit on your favorite podcast app. Leave us a rating and review us on Apple Podcasts. And most importantly, share with your friends. Tell your friends you like this podcast. Say it to them to their face. Literally the best way to share a podcast, to get new listeners, is through word of mouth. Help us out. Testify. Spread the word about Intuit. Intuit is hosted by me, Sam Sanders. The show is produced by Janae West, Travis Larchuk, Gabby Grossman, and Jelani Carter. Our fearless editor is Jordana Hochman. Our engineer is Daniel Turek. Our music is composed by Breakmaster Cylinder. Hannah Rosen is the editorial director of audio at New York Magazine. 
We are back next Thursday with a new episode. Until then, protect Dolly Parton at all costs. All right, bye.